I mean, anybody who's shot for Coca-Cola knows how to capture drinks, right? With Shake and Bacon, I'm Joni Simon. Welcome to my studio. This is where I do food photography, and the goal here is to improve your food photography skills so you can feel confident behind the camera. And this video is part two in a three-part series all about drinks and going behind the scenes and telling the stories of people in the drinks industry who do drinks really well, who bring a lot of expertise to this field. And who better to do that than somebody who has shot for Coca-Cola, Burger King, and some of the world's biggest biggest global brands, Yum! Brands, if you're not familiar with them, that represents Taco Bell and Pizza Hut, KFC. So this man is incredibly talented. I came across Terry Campbell uh, through his book, Food Photography and Lighting. And I just, I mean, I kind of go a little nuts in this video and chatting with him about that book, but I just want to make sure you understand this book had a major impact on the way that I see lighting, that uh, the way that I understand the way to manipulate light, uh, and some really cool creative techniques and so I'm super honored too that as a part of this video Terry has agreed to give away four signed copies of his book and so I have those I have all the details about the giveaway linked down below so you can go check that out we're running it on Instagram but I'm gonna go ahead and stop yammering because I am so excited for you to meet Terry to hear his story hear some of his insight into 30 years of a food photography career and some very specific helpful things that I think you're gonna love about drinks so I I believe I first came across you, Terry, because I read your amazing book, Food, Photography, and Lighting, which, when did you write that book? 2000, it was written more in 2012 when 2013. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay. So, I mean, I, I consider myself a well-read person. I read a lot of photography books, but um, the impact your book had on me was pretty significant. Um, and I just really love how you describe lighting, how you go through your process and how it's very, to me, different than what I had seen other people teaching. You know, So I was just wondering before we jump into the drink, if you could just talk a little bit about like where you learned your lighting style, because especially the thing I think the aha moment for me was how you bounce light a lot more often than shooting through, you know, uh, soft boxes or scrims or things like that. I mean, you certainly do that. But to me, it was how you bounce your light um, mm -hmm. using reflectors, and especially like the bent V flat. Uh, yeah. If you could just talk to me kind of how did that that develop and how did that become such an important part of your style? Um, yeah, that the, the V flat probably happened if I remember right, it happened when I was shooting a job for Reynolds for the foil and we were shooting a job. We had to light a pretty large set and I was trying to replicate, you know, some window light that I had been seeing like when I was, you know, just when digital kind of came in and you're taking your camera everywhere and going to lunch and shooting pictures, I started noticing a lot more of the available light and kind of how it interacted. And I was trying to replicate something I had seen at, you know, one of the lunches where the light was diffused coming in through a window, but it was bouncing around outside. It wasn't a direct light coming through. And so I just kind of had the idea of how can I create that in a studio? I started building like this foam core wall and then realized that the light was just kind of bouncing everywhere. So in an attempt to kind of direct it, that's when I bent the foam core to, to bend it down and kind of make it a parabolic reflector to keep the light bouncing down on the set instead of just bouncing up and onto the ceiling and everywhere else. Yeah. So that's kind of how that developed. Um, you know, using that bouncing light. And then I, I use that a lot still, and I use a lot more diffusion now, but I still use that bounce light as well. I use, I have a big gray wall now that I, I built mostly for lighting liquids because if I put a white, it, it was, it's an eight by eight flat and it's made out of foam, so it floats, so I could hang it above my set. Mm. And if you had that as white, as a reflector, it's really hard to get it to fade out. So if you paint it gray, and you put a light on the middle of it, it fades toward the edges, you know, so you don't see those white edges reflecting in whatever you're trying to shoot. Absolutely. So I have this, so I have this big gray wall now. That's kind of my go-to of late is this big gray wall. So not only do I use it over things when I'm trying to get reflection, but I also just use it as my bounce wall now sometimes instead of the foam core, I'll use this big gray wall and just bounce light into that. So I still get this big, soft, diffused light. Oh, yeah. And if I have reflections, it usually fades to the ends to where you don't see that square reflector. 
You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, I just, I love the creativity with that. It seems like, I mean, how, how, how long have you been at this, Terry? How many years? Yeah, a little over 30 doing? years now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you're still like 30 years in, you're still evolving and coming up with new strategies. Well, that's, I mean, that's what I love. I love exploring. I mean, digital for me, I mean, I'm an old film shooter, obviously started in film. Digital to me just opened my eyes to so many things. You know, I didn't like to shoot location because I really liked to have control. And you didn't know with film until you got back if it worked. And, you know, you might get back and go, oh, I wish I had moved that salt shaker two inches to the left. Well, it's way too late now, you know. But with digital, I can go shoot on location. I can try stuff. I see the results right away. Even in the studio, I, you know, I love trying stuff, like just overexposing the heck out of it. And then you go, oh, well, that didn't work for the foreground, but I like what it did in the background. So I'll make my background brighter. With film, I never would have done that because yeah. that's cost. That's money to just shoot it two stops overexposed. I'm not going to just do that. Yeah. But with digital, I can do that. And yeah, I mean, learning is, for me, what it's all about. I love light. I love exploring. You know, things change. You try new stuff. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I almost think back, like, if I have to recreate a shot, if a client comes back and now they've got a sausage cheese sausage cheese biscuit and before they only had a bacon egg and cheese biscuit and they want the same set I kind of think back like what was I into back then oh I was probably using the bent foam core or I was probably <laughs> using the big gray wall you know I'm gonna go through my phases. what era was that right yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's like Madonna like which season yeah. were we in I had you pick which I had to think this was a hard job to pick one photo that uh has fake ice in it because I mean goodness sakes how many how many uh drinks photos do you have in your library <laughs> yes there's a bunch <laughs> so many but i'm curious because i love this shot this cocktail shot um yeah. and so everybody can see it here uh why did you select this one what is it about this one that made you want to pick this this whole series was just kind of fun it was for the glass the company that makes the glassware not for the drink company mm -hmm. but they make glassware so we shot a variety of drinks coffees mixed drinks you know, all kinds of things to show the variety of glassware and how you could use it. So this one was just one that I really enjoyed doing. It looked, you know, a lot of fun and was just had the ice look that I really loved. And so that's kind of what led me to this one. Yeah. Well, the thing that struck me about this is that, I mean, you know, we're using the, the fake ice here in this situation and clearly you've got the good stuff, right? Like in and of itself, it's very convincing. It's beautiful, but I have to think there's a certain amount of magic on your end to take what's already a great product uh, and make, give it that extra little sparkle, give it that little extra dynamic quality so that it's even that much more convincing. So I'm, I would love it if you, could walk us through what are some of the considerations in setting up this shot um, that specifically lent toward that that convincing look that we see there those sparkles that character um, that take a great product and take it to the next level you know that's the thing about fake ice I really think it does it for you you know there's really yeah. there's not a lot you need to do if you're lighting the glassware in a, in a nice way the biggest issue I've had with fake ice is that you can get a hard highlight if you've got it rotated in your glass a certain way and you're getting a sharp bounce off of your light, you can get a highlight that's a little too bright. Mm. But other than that, fake ice is just so beautiful. It's really <laughs> the, the bigger, the bigger fails I see with fake ice are about not matching the level of the liquid to the ice in a way mm. that looks believable. You know, mm. if the, if it comes up too high, then the ice looks like it's sinking. And if it's too low, which is more often the case, the ice just looks fake because it's floating way too high out of the glass and wouldn't really do that. In this case with a cocktail, you know, it's supposed to be resting on the bottom so it can float a little higher, but oftentimes with um, sodas or Cokes, you know, you see that the, the ice is floating up too high and it just doesn't look believable. So. Gotcha. So what's the trick to really dialing that in? I think it's just seeing it, you know, looking at it, maybe look at some other images while you're doing it to look online to what looks believable, what looks realistic and what feels fake to you, you know, I mean, that's, it's subjective, I guess. Yeah. So um, it's just kind of looking at it and deciding how high you want the liquid to be. So that's, that's the biggest challenge for me is where to put the liquid. You know, we often pour liquid in and they go, eh, put a little more in a little more, maybe try it a couple different ways, but the ice stays really great. Usually you, you know, I'll set the glass up empty. Mm -hmm. And I'll put the ice in it and make sure my reflections are right. And when you pour the liquid in, it's always going to change it some, you know, and then you can 
you know, spin it a little bit if you have to and, and get it where you need to be. But that ice, there's really not a lot of consideration outside of lighting the glass. Gotcha. The ice kind of lights itself. Yeah, because I mean, just the way that those sparkles kind of come through. And now for this particular setup, um, you sent me the diagram. So I'm going to share that here with everybody. Um, can you just walk me through um, what we're looking at here in this diagram? Because I do think that, you know, the position of like the backlights and things like that can really help too. Yeah, there's a, there's a Roscoe diffusion paper behind it, um, and then the light is directly behind that. And the paper is so diffused, you don't see the light, but obviously the light's kind of spreading out from the center. Mm -hmm. And then in the front, I'm using a, um, a light source through a polarizer filter. So the polarizer is about 12 by 12 inches. And yep. then I have a polarizer on my camera. So with the combination of the two polarizers, you can virtually eliminate the highlight reflection you would get from that front light source. That's a way to light bottles a lot of times when you need to light up the label, but you don't want a highlight reflecting. You know how a dark beer bottle is. You just can't find a position where the light's not reflecting. Yeah. So you can polarize the light in one direction, polarize your lens in the other yeah. direction, and you cross out the reflection. But you still get the benefit of the light brightening up, in that case, the label. Okay. Or in this case, brightening up, you know, the, the color of the liquid and showing the glass. Mm -hmm. So, and then there's a black card, I think, on the back right side, just to give mm -hmm. it some edge. Mm -hmm. And then that gray wall that we talked about earlier on the left is yeah. what's kind of giving me my soft glow on the left side. Yeah. The polarizer is obviously adjusting that to a little bit, kind of making it a little softer. Right. Now, is that gray on the left? I mean, is that bouncing more of a highlight or is that bouncing more of a shadow? It sounds it's like it's more of a highlight. A little more of a highlight. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That is really, that is neat. It's always so much fun to see the behind the scenes on these things. And I know folks really love those. The thing that really though sends me in this photo that makes me just go, oh, is, the, is the highlight on the drip. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> how um in terms of that drip i have to assume i mean talk me through that process and making sure to capture that moment yeah that's post obviously so we yeah. we shot it you know as it was and then we had the stylist in this case a bartender because mm -hmm. when i'm doing drinks like this i usually hire a bartender instead of a food stylist smart um so in this case we we brought in and had um them just use an eyedropper and put a drip on the top and then of course it ran around the cherry and start to drip and then just pop, pop, pop till you catch it where you want it to be. Wait for that yeah. moment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then, of course, it drips down, ruins the drink, and then you just Photoshop it into your good drink. That's perfect. That is perfect. That's a great tip, though, to work with bartenders if you're specifically working in drinks. Um, any suggestions for folks who, you know, are looking to collaborate with other bartenders, how to approach those folks, how to start those conversations? Um. I'm thinking the bartenders we've run across for the most part have been models that we've used in the past that actually uh -huh. bartend on the side. And so we call them back in for some drink stuff. We have one in particular we use a lot. Um, so we kind of ran across them that way, but I'm sure there's other ways to find people that bartend. The other um, thing we've used, especially, you know, um, not chefs, but specialized people for is just the other day we were doing a cappuccino. Okay. And to get a cappuccino machine and to mess with it, try to get it working right. And if you have a problem and it's not working, what do you do? So there's a local company here that um, has the machines that they usually send out to events where they want a cappuccino machine or whatever. But we have hire their baristas and their machines. They're used to doing this for photo shoots. So they come in and prepare the drinks. And if the machine doesn't work, it's on them to figure it out. And of course, they know how to do it and make it look right. It would take someone else a lot of trial and error to get what we need. So... Yeah. So, you know, baristas and bartenders. That's, I mean, that's the trick of any photographer, right? Is it's a bunch about finding the right people to collaborate with and specialists in their own right. Yeah. And the people that you work with, you know, food stylists too. It's, it's, yeah. I always say like, you can have the best food photographer and the best food stylist in the world, but if they don't work well together, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It's really, you know, who you connect with and who you work well with. Thank you so much to Terry for taking the time out of his busy schedule to chat with us, to share some insight, for being super generous with his knowledge, and again, for being super generous with that giveaway. You're gonna love his book. I've got all the details about the giveaway, or if you just wanna buy the e-version of the book, it's all linked down below. But now we're gonna jump into part three of this series, and this is gonna be all about ice. Because if you've noticed in the interview with Stuart before this, and then talking 
talking to Terry, they're both using Trengove Ice, which is an industry standard. It's the gold standard. It's the best out there. But when it comes to the ice from Trengove Studios, it's more than just cubes. And so I thought, who better to talk to than Tom Trengove himself? So if you want to catch that interview, go ahead and hop in to video number three.